Okay, well, let's get into it. So um, we've got um, about an hour, um, and the uh, Trent Global guys actually picked the name for this presentation. Normally, I get to pick the name, but they uh, they picked this title, BIM There, Done That. Um, I guess the Americans say I got the T-shirt. Um, so it had kind of inspired me to go back and look at what has happened in the last 15 years, um, what have we learned, um, and how do we use that lesson to stay competitive in... I don't. I don't even think post nineteen COVID nineteen is the right term. I think the, I think an active COVID nineteen scenario, where even today we're now concerned about a second wave coming through Singapore, Malaysia, and the region. So it's very much a, a real COVID nineteen time, um, and we've still got a long time before we actually uh, can do post COVID nineteen. So today's presentation. Uh, let me first of all introduce myself, so you know who I am. Um, my name is uh, Rob, obviously Ronan Collins. I'm originally Irish, um, and just want to check that you guys can see all see my slide. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so my wife is actually from Malaysia. My wife was born in Ipoh and grew up in Ipoh and then moved to KL when she was in her early 20s. Um, she used to play squash for Malaysia. So uh, Wally was the, um, won an, a national medal for Malaysia in the South Asian, South Asian Games. Um, of course, I'm not allowed to tell you when that was because I will be giving away her age. So she, we keep that one private. But uh, that's my beautiful son, Michael, who's now turning six. It's been the shortest six years of my life. So we moved back to Malaysia about four years ago. And um, if you want to find out about me professionally, then I would recommend that you follow me and connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, you can find all the details about me on my LinkedIn profile, where I've worked, what I've done, what I've been up to. Um, and more importantly, I share quite a lot of articles and posts. So if you want to keep up to date what's happening in the construction industry regarding regards to technology, BIM, collaboration, new concepts, old concepts, then feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and uh, we can keep in touch that way. So, um, not quite sure what happened there. And then the other way you can find out um, other presentations that we've done, you can look me up on YouTube. I've got my own channel, but it's quite a new channel. It's only got 37 subscribers, so obviously not very popular. Um, I use that primarily to share these kind of presentations and webinars, and I started doing that the last couple of months, so it's a good way of doing it. Um, and before we moved to Malaysia, I had my own business in Hong Kong, and the company used to be called IntelliBuild. Now, the website still exists, but only barely. Uh, but the YouTube channel is there, and it's quite popular. There's about 2,500 people subscribed to it. So we don't put up videos there anymore, but there is a lot of historic videos there. So there's a lot of previous presentations, there's a lot of good case studies. Um, and what's been interesting about preparing for this evening's presentation is the realization that we were doing stuff 15 years ago, that would still be considered innovative in 2020. So I'm going to show you some examples of that as we go through. So we're going to do a bit of time travel. And um, we're not going to go quite back to 1930, but this is always a good reference point. This is the Empire State Building. This is a 4D sequence, albeit a photographic 4D sequence. 4D being a link between the actual building and the schedule. What's fascinating about that project was that in 1930, that building was built in over just over 400 days. It was built using modular systems, and it was built with a huge labor force of about three and a half thousand workers per day on site. And what's crazy is, I'm not sure we've actually moved very far, far forward from the technologies that they used in those times in terms of the precasting, the planning, the design, etc. So it's always a good point to look at. So in preparation for this evening's presentation, I went back and I looked at what we were doing in 2003, 2006. So. Um, we did a lot of stuff in early days around building models and doing 4D sequences, and I'll show you an example. Between 2006 and 2010, we got involved with a, a large airline cargo terminal in Hong Kong called the Cathay Pacific Cargo Terminal. That was the first BIM project that I came across where the client actually mandated the use of technology from the very beginning. Now, that's back in 2005, 2006. So that's a pretty forward-looking client. In 2006, 2008, we worked on a casino in Macau, which I'm going to show you an example of. I've even managed to find the model file, so I'll show you the model. Um, and then in 2008, 2015, there was the Hong Kong MTR BIM journey. And in 2010 through 2015, we worked on the Hong Kong Airport Midfield Concourse. So I'm going to show you the Midfield Concourse example. But if you want to learn more about the other projects, you can certainly look it up. And then we're going to wrap up the presentation by looking at what's been happening in KL over the last three or four years and what we see is coming up in, in terms of trends in the next five years. So it's kind of a, a bit of a history lesson in what I've experienced in BIM. And it's also a bit of a look forward to what's going on. But the primary message in this evening's presentation is, and go as good as BIM is, 
it doesn't solve many of the challenges that are facing our industry. Um, low cost consultancy fees, low cost bidding, aggressive contracts, risk sharing, silo mentality, lack of collaboration, and many, many more problems. So we'll touch on some of them as we go forward, but this is the kind of the roadmap. So let's have a look at the first ever BIM project. Um, this was actually done in 2005 before BIM, the term was even coined. So this was actually a school. It's a auditorium and a um, drama and teaching facility for a private school in Hong Kong. So a very large school, um, plenty of money to build these kind of facilities. But the designer and the contractor were doing two dimensional design. And I was working with the owner to do BIM. So what we did was we were taking two dimensional drawings and building these models. And we were building these models in CAD, so we weren't even we didn't even know about Revit at this point. So, for example, we did some of the um, construction sequencing. So here's an example where we like, looked at the it's a very steep site. So we looked at the temporary works, we looked at the piling, and we looked at the excavation for the pile caps. And anybody who's worked on a civil engineering project will realize that this is a very complicated site given the nature of the, of the locations and the levels of all the different pile caps. And uh, that slight slope is about thirty degrees. So. If you've got, um, I think there was one or two engineers, you'd realize that this is a very steep, very complicated site. So this was what we were doing 15 years ago. So anybody who says they're, they're building a 3D model of a site, well, that's what I would expect. Um, and even then, 15 years ago, we were building 3D models of the mechanical electrical systems for coordination. So we were basically building the ductwork models, the pipework models, and we were using those to find coordination issues and find problems in the design. So... That's where we started from, and that led us into a very large and very complicated project a few years later. So in 2006, 2008, we got involved in this project called the City of Dreams Casino in Macau. So I'm going to show you some examples from that project. But before I do, let me just show you what I found as a little treasure chest. So this is actually a 3D Navisworks model. So Navisworks is a tool that we use for federating models. So in this model, we have a whole bunch of different files, architectural files, we've got electrical files, we've got fire files, and we've got structural files. So this is the actual entirety of the design for this particular project. And I can use this tool to navigate around. Now bear in mind, this file is 12 years old. This is from 2006, 2007. So we built this model 12 years ago. So again, anybody that says, oh, I'm new to Navisworks, well, we were doing this a long time ago. So the challenge with this project was that we were building these models from design information from the consultants. So these models were put together based on two-dimensional drawings. And if I go to a grid line, I can cut the model along a particular project grid. So in this example, I've just picked it along grid line H. And what I want to show you here is a couple of things. You can see that we've got different buildings for different parts of the facilities. So this is a hotel block. This is a hotel block. There's a what they call the energy center, which is a centralized mechanical electrical plant. There's a, a theater space here, which at one point was a, a water based theater. And then one of the features of the casino is this very complicated geometry for this um, projection system. It's actually a three dimensional projection system. It is super cool if you get a chance to see it if you go to macau it's the uh, city of dreams in macau and they can do all kinds of cool stuff in here they can have dragons running around and a whole bunch of stuff so but the problem was how do we build that geometry both for the shell internally for the projection screens and for the feature roof on the top so this is what we were doing 12 years ago and this led us to explore parametric modeling or parametric technology here you can see a snapshot from the model so you can see the different hotels at that point they were labeled in letters um, the service apartments were built in recently, um, and that's a whole different project. So when you look at this, this was the architectural two-dimensional layout for what was called a bubble. Um, so it's a, a pure sphere on the inside, but it's got a distortion to it. And when you cut a section through it, it's got this kind of, um, I guess you would call it a fitness ball that somebody like me was sitting on in terms of weight. So it's a deformed spherical shape. And our job was to try and work out not just the geometry, but the construction detailing for this particular surface. So this, again, was quite early days in terms of parametric modeling. So the only tool that was available to us at that point was uh, paper sketches. So this is us working out the principles. And then we moved to basically what is um, CATIA. And CATIA is the same software they use to design and build Boeing and Airbus aircraft. So this is a very sophisticated, very complicated piece of technology. 
Um, we had to train the staff to use it. We had to figure out how to use it ourselves. And our objective wasn't just to figure out the geometry. Our objective was to figure out all the construction details. So here you can see how we worked out the different surface areas for doing quantification, worked out the surface areas internally, and then we started working out all the framing details. So we learned quite a few lessons on this project in terms of being able to define the geometry. Um, and this little diagram was actually provided to the fabricator for the steel work so they could actually figure out how to cut and fabricate the steel to make sure that this primary support for the dome was exactly correct. So you can see here that we've actually created these coordinate points from this very complicated model. So this was our first foray into complicated 3D modeling, and we've done a few more since then. What's interesting is you'll hear people talking about BIM and how, how we can use it for quantification and we can do builds of quantities and everything else. Again, 12 years ago, we were using these tools to do steel quantification. So we could work out member by member, length by length, what the actual tonnage of steel was. Now, granted, doing steel takeoff and concrete takeoffs easier than some other methods, but it was interesting when I brought these slides back up, you can see this is a very old slide, even given this ratio, that we were actually doing these kind of quantity takeoffs back then. Is I want to speak to you about another project, which we started in 2005, um, and it actually was completed in 2010, which was the Cathay Pacific Cargo Terminal. So the Cathay Pacific Cargo Terminal, the owner specified, and the gentleman's name was Mr. Ian Hunt, he's since retired and is now living in the UK, um, he specified the use of BIM for coordination. So we had to figure out, with a whole bunch of consultants who'd never done it before, how to generate this design in 3D. But the trick was, everything was done in 3D first. There was no 2D drawings and then modeling. All the modeling was done first, and then the drawings were produced from the models. So let me show you a bit, of, a few examples from this project to show you, show you how this worked. So the first thing we did was we worked out a process how to do the architectural model. So we actually used a very early version of Revit. I think it was 2007, uh, version seven, I think it was, maybe version six. And then working with the architect, and that time it was ADAS, um, we built out the architectural model, then we built out the structural model, which was Meinhardt, and then we built out the primary MEP model, which was also Meinhardt. So we had this kind of idea, of we'd have an initial architectural model, and then we build up a stage two structural model, MEP model, and then we get to the actual stage three, which would be the construction modeling. So this would be a very detailed model for the construction phase. So we had a very simple understanding of what we're going to do. So this was Revit based, um, this is the actual final design model for the Revit system. So for the architectural system, sorry. Um, and you can see here some very large roof safe spaces. You can see some very large ramps. And then there was an office building and then there was a the main cargo facility. There was a separate structural model um, and we did everything we could to make sure that the structural model was not replicated by the architect in any way. So there was limitations in the software back then. They're, they're not as bad now, but they're still there. But you would really want the structural engineer to model all the structure and the architect to model all the architecture. So to give you an example of what the structure would look like, the structure was a, based on a precast system. So we had these uh, T-shaped precast elements. So even back then, we started realizing that we needed to make sure we named these things in a sensible manner so we could find them. So we put in type codes. We made sure the level was identified. We made sure that the system was identified so we knew it was structural framing. And then we gave it a name so we knew what we we're looking for if we wanted to count them. So we would actually use these models to quantify the precast concrete, even at the design stage. Once we moved into the construction stage, then we learned a very valuable lesson. And this is the benefit of working in a collaborative team with the contractors and designers. The first lesson that I learned, and this is now 10 years ago, is that the, de the design model produced by the consultants is often not detailed enough. And what I mean by that is, that is you end up with these little kind of weird details where the beam comes sailing into a column, there's a, a wall connected to the column, and then there's a staircase beside it. But then there's a question is, where does the beam terminate? Does it terminate beneath the beam? Does it terminate the face of the beam? So we have to basically raise these kind of queries to confirm how we extend the beam to that. So this is an issue where there's a lack of detail on the models. And the model that you can see here that's much more colorful, this was actually a Tecla model that was built by the contractor at the construction phase. So the other thing that we discovered is that most designers work in a flat space when they're doing large car park structures or large bus structures, or in this case, truck structures. But when you start to in, in, involve precast concrete and you start involving cross falls, you start to realize that there's a number of problems with the design for the corbels, and we had a number of issues with these corbels in terms of the actual positioning. So again, the amount of detail that's required to get BIM to work 
sometimes you're relying on the contractor to get that detail. And the lesson I've learned and the thing I've been saying for 10, 15 years, the sooner we can start the contractors, or in this case, the subcontractors for the precast concrete, the sooner we can get them involved in the modeling and the detailing, the sooner we can solve problems in the coordination. So here you can see an example where the, the beams have to be at different levels and then you have to have different coping or corbels to actually make sure you pick up all these different levels. Otherwise, you end up with a, a flat slab full of water. So the, the, the lesson here is get the detail in the model as quickly as possible. And we're going to skip the uh, same thing here. So again, there's another problem here where you have all these different elements connecting into a column. There's actually a movement joint. And again, the movement joint wasn't properly detailed by the consultants or properly considered. So again, these kind of, you see it on the drawing, the movement joint details to be finalized. This is one of the problems we have in the industry is that you'll see com comments on drawings like to be finalized, or my favorite is omitted for clarity. In other words, I haven't got a clue how I'm doing it, so I'm gonna omit the details. So if you see omitted for clarity on a drawing, get very concerned. So, so it ends up being the contractor that has to solve these issues. So here you can see the problem is that they've got a lower corbel and then they've got an upper level beam traveling into it. And then these are supposed to be connected to the main beam, but they're a couple of millimeters too high of it. So there's a big, big concern about how does this work? There's another connection here. There's a corbel here. So the main beam is connected to the column, but then it doesn't connect to the other beam. So there's a, a large number of details to be sorted out here. So again, this level of detail, this level of information, it only starts coming out when the contractors get involved. So very often the challenge with BIM is that design consultants don't operate to enough detail to make the models valuable. So the next thing I'm going to show you is um, people talk about, oh, well, we're doing a common data environment and we've got PAS 1192 and we're using BS 1192 and now we're talking about ISO 19650 and it's all fantastic and it's all very confusing. On this project in 2007, we had a very simple understanding of how to manage the project information. And this, in this case, the project drawing documentation. So let me very quickly explain how this works. And then this is what I'm gonna explain is the same principles that are in all the latest BIM standards coming out of the UK, coming out of uh, ISO, coming out of BCA. They're all based on the same principle. So here's the principle. You build models first. You coordinate the models to produce a coordinated design. And from those coordinated models, you produce either design drawings if you're a consultant, or you produce shop drawings or construction drawings or fit-out drawings if you're a contractor. The principle has not changed in 15 years. You build a model and then you extract the drawings. The problem is most of the industry currently thinks that they build the drawings first and then from that you make the models. Um, I can tell you from bitter experience that does not work. So this is just an example, this made me laugh. So when we look back at this, we had a challenge where the systems, this should be MHS system, the air cargo systems were done in AutoCAD. The structure was in Revit, the architectural model was in Revit, but the MEP was an Autodesk MEP, which is effectively CAD. So we had an interoperability problem, even though we were using Autodesk software, they'd only just bought Revit. So Revit was not compatible with Autodesk platform. So we had a lot of challenges getting all this coordinated. So it all says Autodesk software, but they're not always interoperable. So this is how we did it. We had a server in the project. We had 3D models on that server. We used those models to produce drawings. So we had CAD files. And then from those CAD files, we produced PDFs and DWFs. All we had to do was make sure that the system was kept managed and controlled. So what we did, looking back on it, it's quite interesting. We had a live folder for the working information and we had a published folder. So the published folder was then sub broken down into disciplines. So under each discipline, we had the published CAD files, we had the published 3D models, we had the published Clash files, and we had the Revit models. And in those days, we had no choice. We had to produce CAD files for the other disciplines. So we had a work in progress process and we had a published process, which is what is currently in all the ISO and BAS standards. And just to give you a sense of it back then, there was 760 drawings for the architecture. There was 1,600 drawings for the building services, and there was over 800 drawings for the structural models. So there was quite a lot of information available from the design team for the construction project. Now, this is what we mean by model first, draw second. So even back then, even with AutoCAD MEP as our, as our tool, which is still one of the better tools that was ever created, you would take a 3D model, in this case, of all the combined services. So you can see here sprinkler pipes, electrical trays, and ductwork. 
And then you would generate either two-dimensional plans, which were color-coded, so you could see what discipline was which, or you could use it to create sections, so the software would generate the sections. Now, this is basically what Revit does today. So you build a model, and then from that model, you generate drawings. And these examples are basically just showing the level of development or level of detail that we had in the models for the design, excuse me, for this particular project. So again, there's nothing new in what Revit's doing. There's nothing new in what BIM is doing in terms of modeling and drawings. Um, but the problem is, 10, 15 years later, people are still not doing it. And it begs the question, why? Now, to show you the level of complexity in the system, this is very quickly to show you what's going on. There's a mechanical system, a fire system, electrical system, a drainage system, and a structural system. And these are very complicated systems. These are smoke extract systems, fresh air supply systems. This is the electrical system, which is vast because it's a fully automated cargo facility. Fire protection is abundant because of all the potential fire hazards. And then obviously you've got a lot of drainage and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is something that we created for the project. and. If you look at some of the actual, I've seen this used in some of the university courses in the UK. Um, this is actually the clash detection matrix that we designed. And now you hear people talking about clash matrix and clash detection system. Essentially, what you're doing is you're working out coordination issues. So you work out what's the high priority, what's the low priority. So in our case, the working areas and the truck paths were high priority and the coordination of the plumbing with the fire protection and the plumbing electrical was low priority. So we were working our way through the process and we used the tools available at the time in the software. So we created all the analysis, we ran all the, the clashes, and we generated all the results. And what we did then is no different than what you would do now in Navisworks. So the only difference is the resolution of the image, but it's essentially the same thing. So the software will tell you where the ductwork is interfering with the concrete. It's always been easy to find the problems. Finding a problem in a 3D model and not resolving it only means one thing. That problem's going to appear on site. So I can guarantee you from the, the last 15 years of experience, if you don't solve the problem in the 3D model, it's not going to go away, and it's going to come back and bite you as an RFI if you're a design consultant. So the sooner we solve the problem in the model, the better. The real challenge that is only recently being solved is how do we link what's happening on the site to the 3D model? So here's a picture from the construction site. You can see the large ducts. You can see the scale of the building. It's a huge building. And you can see that they've actually put an opening into the smoke screen to align up with the ductwork. So we can see visually, but just from a camera angle, compared to the model, we can see how these things line up. The only difference between that and now is we can now use laser scanning, we can use photogrammetry, and we can use augmented reality, and we can bring these models to the site. So we can actually see what's going to happen in these locations. So this is very early in the construction phase. We can see what service is going to go in this area. So here's some good examples. So here you can see the coordinated ductwork from the construction model, and you can see the as-built ductwork on the site. And again, you can see the sprinkler systems as installed. Same thing here, you can see the ductwork was coordinated across over, and it was built accordingly. The challenge that the contractors have is that you spend a huge amount of effort building these models, and if the guys on site don't follow them, then you're basically undermining all of the engineering that went into the models. So the challenge is making sure that what's built on site is a reflection of what's in the models. Otherwise, you've got to rebuild stuff or take things down. And I'll speak about how we did it with laser scanning in a couple of minutes. So again, another example, um, and this is a kind of a game of spot the difference, but essentially this image is showing that instead of a square corner, they just put in a rounded corner, which is no big deal, but the rest of the pipework is all stepping to match the structure. So that building is operational. It has been operational for the best part of 10 years, but most people will forget that it was actually designed and built using a BIM system. Now, the great thing is that team then went on and did two more projects using the same learning and same processes. So that's a good example if you wanted to see how a BIM project is going to get done. And the challenge I have for anybody that's watching this presentation is, are you operating to that level of detail now, 10 years after it was done in Hong Kong on the Cathay project? Um, and I'm pretty sure the answer is going to be, uh, no, Ronan, we're not. This is from... A bit more recent times, this is done between 2012 and 2015, uh, early 2016. Um, as best I can remember, this went operational in 2016, so about four or five years ago. Uh, this building, if you stood it on its end, would be the tallest building in the world. It's a very, very long airport facility. Um, and rather than spend another 15 minutes doing another presentation, let me just quickly show you the slide deck I found from a presentation I did. I actually did this presentation in Canada, would you believe? So let's see if we can zoom in a bit. I think that's the maximum. 
so you can see that there's an outline of how we did it. You can see an organization chart. You can see that we've got an issues, solutions, and schedule. So we actually worked out a BIM deliverable schedule. And this is based on the learning from the cargo facility. You can see that we've learned quite a few lessons over our time. So one of the things that we learned was to get the contractors involved as early as possible. Um, and the MEP coordination was critical on this project. It's an airport, there's a lot of services, a lot of complexity. But the one thing I want to show you is an evolution of the parametric and complex geometry from what we did as a simple bubble in the casino to what became very complicated geometry for this roof. So the challenge with this roof was, again, the architect thought that it was sufficient to just justify the geometry for the roof. And it's a standing seam roof, which means it's an aluminium system that requires a whole bunch of secondary steelwork, an acoustic layer, and a waterproofing system on the external envelope. And then there's an ent entirely complicated ceiling on the interior. The challenge is that when architects use these tools, they don't put in enough detail. So all they've done here is they've identified the location for a gutter, but they haven't actually worked out the detail for the gutter. They've put in locations for the roof lights, but they've not put in the details for the roof lights. So this is the, what the architect thought was sufficient for the detail for the design. And when you get down to their geometry, they're doing exactly what we did 10 years earlier, just plotting out X, Y, and Z coordinates on a three-dimensional surface. But they didn't actually provide the detail. So this is what it looks like in the design model that we received in Navisworks. So you can see there's a very simplistic surface. There's a very basic structural steel element under it. And the contractor that I was working for had to then take this on board and work out how to build it. So this is what the design model looks like. So this was what was provided by the design consultants. And, and you can see it's a primary structure only. And I'll show you the difference in a second. This is the actual fabrication model. So if I go back up, that's the design model. And this is the fabrication model. There is a vast difference between what has to be modeled for fabrication and what has to be modeled for design. And I will accept the argument from the design consultants that their job is not to do the fabrication detailing. I don't, I don't disagree. But they don't put in enough detail. For example, they hadn't detailed any of the edge structures. So we started identifying a large amount of extra steel that was required that hadn't been allowed for in the design. And in some cases, because of all the steel work, they didn't actually provide for the headroom required for maintenance, which became a real issue. So the first thing we had to do was we had to model these purple zones, which were the headroom areas. And then we had to start modifying steel work and modifying details to allow for a gantry access so people could go in and change light bulbs, check fans, check filters, etc. So the design didn't allow for operational space and, and facility management. When we started putting in the systems for the roof, these are the panels that sit in the middle of the roof. These are the acoustic panels. And then you can see this from underneath. Then we started building MEP systems. Then we started working out the ceiling system that had to be hung underneath. And then we worked out the architectural features for the actual ceiling panels. These ceiling systems were detailed by the fabricator. Um, and there's a huge variety of these ceilings. I think there's 75 or 85 different types of panels. So this is what it looks like on site. So this was this project, our learning on this project was laser scanning. So this is our first experience using laser scanning. So this is the actual steel model. And we needed to verify that the steel was in the right place in relation to the building services. So we started laser scanning. So we actually used a surveying team and they laser scanned all the steel work. And we were able to then compare the laser scan to the models. Now, what's changed in the last seven or eight years is that we can do this with photogrammetry with our phones nearly as well as we could back then, but not quite as accurate. So if you need the accuracy, then you need laser scanning. If you don't need the accuracy, then you can get away with just using the, the photogrammetry models. We need the accuracy because you can see the ceiling panel is actually tied into the structural steel and it's exposed. So if the structural steel is out of whack, it'll show up in the ceiling lines. The challenge has been, again, on this project, getting from the model to back to the site. All I'm going to show you on this one is these are all the different technology solutions that are now available. So I've shown you examples of BIM from the last 15 years. Virtual reality you can use, augmented reality you can use, you can use drones, which I'm going to show you in a second, photogrammetry, laser scanning, 3D printing, modular for construction, robotics, analytics, and machine learning. The challenge is people will go and pick one of these things and go, oh, I need to figure out how to do laser scanning. But the problem is, you don't need to figure out how to use technology. You need to figure out what the problem is first. So my lesson has been figure out what the problem is, define the problem, define the scale of the problem, and then figure out what solution is going to be best used to, to fix that problem. So you need to figure out the problem before you figure out the technology you're going to use. 
So I'm going to show you an example from um, KL now. So this is the MRT project in KL. This is a very, very big project. This is a 52 kilometer railway alignment. There's a 13 kilometer alignment in tunnels to the city center, and there are 10 stations on this alignment. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to work as the BIM manager for the detail design and construction phase. And we've had an excellent team working with us, and we've been very, very innovative in how we've used the BIM. So this is an example. This is one station of the 10. This is Tidiwangsa. Um, and here you can see an example of these stations. So here you can see an architectural model. Um, and the architectural model is basically built um, first. So we did we went model first, drawing second, which is the same principle we've, we've used in all the previous projects. Here's a structural model. So here you can see diaphragm walls, seat compile walls, structural steel. And again, this is a design model. So this is not the fabrication model, it's the design model, but it's very, very detailed. You can see all the underground utilities. And then you get into the live services. So you can see the ductwork systems, the cable tray systems. You can see the fire sprinkler systems. So again, there's nothing new in this. We've been doing this for quite some time. It's the amount of information is now in these models. And the difference with this project with the previous projects is that the owner wanted these models for facility management or asset management. So these models have been built not just for their geometry, but also for the information that's inside them, which again, is what PASS 1192 and BS 1192 are all about. It's about the information for the project. It's not just about the models. So here you can see the federated model. So what we do, do we do these, oh, skip this one. So what we're looking at is we're trying to make sure that all of these complicated interfaces are coordinated and that all the information for these systems is captured. So on this project, we're really doing building information management as against 3D modeling. So we have to make models of all these systems. We have to coordinate all these systems, but we also have to make sure we capture all the information for the asset management. So here's an example of what that looks like in still. So you've got the very complicated systems in a very confined area. Um, and this is very difficult to coordinate. There's a lot of change, there's a lot of issues, um, and it's got to get coordinated. So the coordination was done in these virtual design workshops. Um, here you can see people using laptops, iPads, uh, shared screens, but they're still using the same software we've been using for years. So this is Navisworks. And the Navisworks system is quite straightforward. They share the models. We check the models to find any clashes. We identify the clashes, and then we have a VDR or a, a review session. And like all the previous projects, we'll find things like ductwork clashing with pipework. We'll find cable trays clashing with escalators um, and any number of issues, thousands of issues. So these issues are all tracked. So the issues are tracked using save viewpoints in Navisworks. So again, the same technology as the casino from 2006. The viewpoints are numbered, the coordinator reviews the issues, and then all those things have to get resolved. The only difference between what we're doing in 2006 and what we're doing now is all the issues are now shared on the cloud. So we use a system called BIM Collab. You could use um, a number of other platforms, but BIM Collab is the one that we've been using. And essentially what happens is all the issues get uploaded to the server. They get assigned to individual users. So here you can see an example. So I can go onto the cloud and I can see online what, I, what are all the issues. So the only difference between this and what we were doing 10 years earlier is that I would have to go to the model to find the issues. Now I can find them on the cloud. And the way we do that with the cloud is we have this common data environment. And for the MRT project, we were using ProjectWise. And for our current projects, we're using Viewpoint for Projects, which is a similar system. And essentially, the CDE, common data environment, is a single source of truth for all the information in the project. So we store all the model files, all the CAD files, all the PDFs on this system. And again, in a very similar manner to what we did with the cargo terminal 10 years ago, instead of it being on the servers, it's on the cloud. So the only difference is we still have to manage the information. It's bigger because of the scale of the project. There are more people involved because of the scale of the project, but the principles have not changed. The file names need to be created named correctly. The folder structures need to be built correctly. The permissions need to be built and people need to be trained. So this is all the information you can put on these systems. Basically, any digital file can be stored on these platforms. Now, the other thing that we've had to learn, and this is where this gets very interesting is that we've got to do this asset classification. So this is the new thing that wasn't going on 10, 15 years ago. So you have to classify all these objects in the models. So in this example, I'm going to show you one station. This is an entity. So this is how the classification works for an entire station. Inside the station is where it gets interesting. You have to classify and identify the space. And it has to be done systematically. It has to be computer readable but it also has to be human readable. So you have to put in this identification for what the space is. 
Then you have to identify the system. So you then have to be able to determine what the system is. Now, this is no different than what we were doing, but you've got to put in these codes. So you've got to make sure you put the right code on the right object in the right system. And then when you get down to individual products, you've got to code that product. So one of these objects has got four pieces of information. It's got a product code, so it knows what it is. It's got a system code, so it knows what system it's in. It's got a space code, so it knows where it is inside of a project. And it's got the entity code, so we know what station it's in. And until you get your head around how you classify all these objects, you cannot start doing any asset information gathering for an owner. So you have to start with this classification system, and it has to start with the designers. If the design consultants are not putting the data into the models, it is too problematic and too troublesome for the contractor to take it on later in the piece. So it has to be done during the design. And if it has to be done during the design, then it has to be specified by the owner to be done at the beginning of the design consultancy. So the first thing you have to do, if you're an owner, and you want to get value from the information, you have to rethink how you're contracting your consultants when it comes to classification for asset information store. The good thing with this project is that Nick Moorcock, who you see here in the middle, was leading the information management side and all of the information management systems. And Nick and his team were given a certificate of approval from the BRE after a number of audits and a number of um, checks and procedures to say that the Gamuda team are past 1192 compliant on this particular project. So we have an actual, one, a very unique past 1192 certificate in this part of the world for the work on that project. So we're very proud of that work. So I'm gonna leave you with some uh, food for thought in terms of how do you go forward? Because the guys in Trent Global asked me to put a futuristic spin on this. So how do you create digital champions or leaders? And what do you need to do? What does your boss need to do? And what do your colleagues need to do? So if it's just yourself, you need to identify the problem, like we've already said. You need to determine a way to use or adapt technology or process to address the problem. Now, here's the thing. I've given you a LinkedIn channel. I've given you a YouTube channel. There are many other channels available. There are a number of people available. This is not new. This hasn't suddenly come up in the last 12 months, 18 months. These processes, these technologies, these systems have been around for a while. The question you have to ask is, why are they not being become more common and more commonly used? And it comes down to point three. You need a budget and you need a plan of action. And if you don't have a budget, you can't go anywhere. So the challenge that we see in the industry is that the architects, the engineers, the consultants are not investing into the training that's required. And they employ these external BIM consultants who don't add any value. The contractors are looking for every opportunity to cut costs because they have bid low cost. And the owners don't understand the value proposition. They don't understand the value of the information. So the whole industry has going to have to invest into learning about these systems. Um, and to show you some examples from, from ourselves, um, the first one I show you is how we change surveying in Gamuda. So surveying used to be, and still is for the most part, a very tedious, very time consuming job. This is um, Mr. Poix, who's the head of surveying. He's heavily committed to using drones and laser scanning to improve surveying at Gamuda. Um, and this is an example of drones. Now, if you want to see the, uh, a lot more detail on drone surveying, as I haven't got time to cover tonight, if you go again to LinkedIn, you'll find an entire article and a video and a case study on how we're using drones for surveying. And it's well worth the time if you can to go and look at them. So once you've got your budget and your ideas set up, then you need to validate the idea. So you've got to get the approval. You've got to get the the next thing. You've got to get acknowledgement for, the, for what you've succeeded in. So when it goes to the C-suite, the CTO, the COO, the CEO, the CIO, the CFO, and any other C person you can think of, you need them to validate the idea. So they need to understand your business case. They need to understand your business proposition and they need to give you the budget. So if you don't make a good business case, you're not getting a budget. So you need to make sure you get that done. They need to make sure they approve the budget and make it available. And then if you are successful or more likely when you are successful, you need them to get, give you the success acknowledgement of the success because you need to be able to beat your chest and encourage other people to do it. So I'm going to show you one example that's been done that way in Gamuda. The team came to the management and said, we want to remove paper from the site. This is a very slow process of approvals on site. There's too much paper for work permits, for safety inspections, and so on and so on. So we've invested in a platform called FieldView, and we've digitized all of the forms on our sites. So now we've got contractors, subcontractors, engineers, clients using this platform in replacement of paper. We have a huge team of people that are doing this. And that group of people have been trained, not just on the technology side, but also on the, on the process change side. So we're do, using these systems for health and safety, for site reporting, for issues, 
for incident reporting, for energy, for inspections and for progress monitoring. We're now also using it for our COVID-19 response. So the same platform, the same devices, the same software has been um, improved and repurposed in some cases to be used for health checking, for COVID-19 test checking, for site access checking. So we've actually used it for security and for health and safety beyond what it was originally intended. You've got C-suite approval, so you've got a budget. You've now got to enroll the rest of your team to participate in a proof of concept or an actual uh, rollout. You've got to get them to attend training. They've got to learn the system. You need those people to provide you feedback, give you suggestions, give you ideas, and need to commit to making the changes in their work processes, processes as success. Whatever your idea is, you have to make it a step change improvement for the people who are doing it. So it has to be an improvement for everybody on the project. So here's one good example to wrap up with. This is John Lim. John is a young engineer. Um, he's part of our graduate training program. John was involved and is still involved with the tunneling operations for the Metro project. And he is a bit of a whiz kid. He was tasked with exploring how could we track all these precast concrete segments. And he was also tasked with, could we improve the productivity of the tunnel boring machines using computer modules and computer algorithms? So I went to visit John to talk about the precast concrete tracking because I've got previous experience with RFID tracking. And John showed me his control room, which is fascinating. So this is where we control all the tunnel boring machines from. And apart from the Christmas tree on one side, there's a screen which is just hidden behind my head, unfortunately. And the screen was showing a, a, a system that I wasn't familiar with. And I said, what's that screen? And John alluded to a piece of software that he written where John and his team had developed basically a self-driving tunneling machine. So they'd written software. So they took all the data that was coming off this system from running the TBM. And then they got a computer running a new piece of software that could actually control the directional drive of the actual tunnel boring machine. So they spent months and months and months using archived data from previous projects to test out their algorithm. And now we're using that algorithm on 12 different tunneling machines. And the autonomous boring tunnel boring machine was so successful that we actually took it forward for a technical product award at the International um, Tunneling Association just last year. And we won the award for the most innovative idea in tunneling. Um, and some of the accolades we've had since are, have been absolutely phenomenal. So Hallway, you can see here, is the head of our tunneling operations. So he's very, very proud of um, Justin and John and the team for what they've achieved. But the important thing here is when the guys went for the awards, the people that actually come up with the system were sent along to, for the accolades. So it's not just senior management who deserve as the award as much as anybody else, but it's also the young engineers getting recognition as well. So that's how we, that's how we champion the, the leaders. That's how you take on these ideas. So we enable them to take ownership. We invest in creating an innovative culture and we celebrate their success. So that's my last slide. Um, and now what we can do is we can open up for Q&A.